worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and that the glory which thou givest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me.
To the Lord and to his work. Um, this is a reminder of the fact that we are born in sin. She is not saved. She has not accepted Jesus yet. But this is a reminder of us that that is our responsibility to live out a Christian life in front of her and to guide her to the Savior as young and, and as real as we possibly can. 
So I'm going to ask uh, my pastor, Brother Mike, if he would come up, and also my family, if they would come up, all my kiddos and my wife. That would be great. I need to get my keys here. This is my first chance to actually get to see this baby face to face. Um, she's awesome. Luke 2.22 tells us that when the time is right, Joseph and Mary took the baby Jesus to the temple to present him to the Lord. That word present means to exhibit, to exhibit. And I mean, you know, look at this baby. Who wouldn't want to show this child off? But the word present also means to place before. Yeah, it means to place before. Which is, so, which is a sort of dedication. And today we're going to witness Jonathan and Holly as they present their new baby girl, Grace Caroline Splon, to the Lord. The scripture reminds us that children are a heritage from the Lord. In Psalm 127.3, we're told, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb is a reward. She's so awesome. She's just listening and attending. The Lord entrusts them to us to raise in the respect of, of God and his service. As parents, we must be vigilant from earliest childhood to stress the importance of God's presence in our lives. This must be done not only in words, but through our actions. Parents must model the Christian life before the family. And as a body, it's our role to support that and be a part of it, too, to always direct, no matter if they're this big or, look at those guys, that big, to constantly direct us to the Lord, or this big. By taking the time to publicly dedicate grace this way, Jonathan and Holly are acknowledging that they take this responsibility and this opportunity seriously and intend to do their very best to raise her to love and obey God. And Jonathan and Holly, if this is your intention, then let's pray together and just follow me, okay? Father God, we love and trust you, and we dedicate Grace Caroline Splon to you. We commit to teaching her about you and to guiding her to learn to love you like we do. Our desire is that she will serve you all the days of her life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can I do this? I love touching baby toes. Thank you. Praise God. What a great honor. Well, I want to thank Pastor Jonathan and Holly for allowing me to, to be here again. I always appreciate that, and I appreciate being received by you. That means a whole lot. You know, receiving is an issue of, of allowing someone or something to be a part of who we are, and not just to hear something or to you know, stay awake, which is always cool. But, but to receive it means that it becomes a part of who we are. At my age, as long as I've been born again, I, rem I remember, believe it or not, I remember things that I learned the first week of salvation, of my salvation. You know, and, and what that means is I was such an open, my heart was so wide open uh, when I was born again, and I hope still is, that, that there was a guy that came through our congregation um, on tour, kind of, and he, he spoke every night for a few nights. And I remember some of the 
the little acronyms and things that are used. It was, it was pretty cool. So, so I do appreciate being received in this place, and it means a lot to me. Uh, there's a lot of not receiving going on out there, so this is cool. Um, the title of this teaching is uh, Getting Unstuck. And what's going to happen with this teaching is that it'll be released probably in article format on our website, and Pastor Jonathan can tell you what that is um, uh, later today. Um, one of the things that I do is I write, and I teach through writing. And, and so um, you get first crack at the teaching. Uh, but I think that something, something like this, one of the things I like about live streaming and keeping it on Facebook, and then I'm going to download this thing to um, my YouTube channel, uh, is that um, more than the people who are able to just come today in this place can learn and hear something that might change their life. And that's why I watch other people's material. So one day... A guy named Moses was out minding his own business, tending the father-in-law's sheep. He moved them from one place to another, and this happened. And it's, it's uh, reported in Exodus 3, 2 through 4. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush does not burn. And really, if, if it was happening to you, you'd have to go look. You know? And, and um, so when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush, and he said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. God spoke to Moses out of a burning bush. Now, a lot of us know this story. We've heard this our whole lives. One day... A guy named Balaam was out, busy, disobeying God. God had told them to not go off with some messengers, but he was going to do it anyway. God sent an angel of the Lord. Then this happened, as told in Numbers 22, verse 22 to 31. The donkey could see the angel blocking the way, and she tried to dodge the angel. He was riding this donkey. And as the donkey tried to protect Balaam, from running into this angel who had a sword drawn, Balaam beat the donkey three times. Finally, the Lord allowed the donkey to, see something, to do something that donkeys generally don't do. She spoke to her owner audibly. Numbers 22, 28 to 31. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and she said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, because you've abused me. Because in, in all this, the animal pushed his foot against a wall or a fence or something. And he says, because you've abused me, I wish there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. So the donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey in which you've ridden ever since I became yours to this day? I mean, this is a pretty logical donkey. He's laying out a pretty good case, you know. And he says, am I not the donkey on which you've ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever disposed to do this to you? Like, have I ever messed with you before? And he said, no. Balaam said, no. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. He bowed his head and fell flat on his face. God got Balaam's attention through words that came out of the mouth of a donkey. Now, just as an aside, while I was putting this together, you know, I think about what is it like to be these people and go through this stuff. Isn't it interesting that while Balaam is busy threatening to kill his donkey with a sword, he's in the presence of an angel whose sword is already drawn against him? Then when he finally sees the angel and the sword, he humbles himself. I wonder how many times we threaten other people and the Lord is at that very same time perfectly capable of and ready to do the same to us, yet restrains himself. Because, you know, well, you can ask my wife, I do some things and say some things and neglect to do some things and don't say some things, I should say, that are infuriating. God restrains himself. And what were we talking about? Oh, yeah. 
God communicating with people in interesting ways. If you read your Bible, and I always recommend that, um, I, I don't think I read the Bible as much as I sh could because I could read the Bible more than I do. So I just, I'm not, I'm not talking down to anybody when I say that. It's good to read our Bibles, you know. When I, when I was doing prison ministry for many years, um, I would go into these prisons and they'd all have these Bibles that ministries had sent to them. And I would just do this just to hear the sound. I'd say, can we open our Bibles? And I'd pick some first. And when they opened them, you know what they did? They cracked. <laughs> and, and it's because they'd never been opened before, you know. And I'd say, you know, these things work better if you open them up, you know, and read them. You know, and it was kind of a gentle nudge. It was funny, but it, it, it gave us the point. <laughs> if your Bible cracks, it's probably never been opened before, you know, because that glue um, has never had a chance to loosen up. If you read your Bible, you see that God likes to communicate with people. In fact, I would say that his favorite thing in the whole wide world is people. He never died for anything else. I think he, he loves us so much and he cares about us so much and he wants to see us flourish so much. He wants to see his intentions for us unfold because you know, it's a blast and it's healthy and it's good. He'll speak directly through pe to people. And some people hear an audible voice. Some people suddenly know something. Some people get dreams or visions. Some people uh, hear him through his word. Some people hear him through songs. I mean, I'm, I'm in the back, and I'm listening to the lyrics of that third song, and I thought this could not be more perfect for what we are, um, we're going to be talking about today. It's just perfect. And I didn't consult with anybody and say, here's the topic, so match the music. And, you know, they don't do that here. I know Jonathan, and I know Holly, and, and I know a lot of these guys, and they don't sit around orchestrating an experience. If the music goes with the word, it's because God did that, you know. He communicated that. So he used dreams, he used visions, he used the scriptures. He will use the coin in the fish's mouth. Matthew 17, 27. He'll use dew that either got fleece wet or let fleece stay dry. Judges 6, 37 to 38. Sometimes he'll use text messages, phone calls, believe it or not, posts on Facebook, even though it only takes five minutes to freak out, right? And, 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 and or other social media because, you know, that stuff's getting invented. New, new platforms are being invented all the time. Everybody's in competition for, for our eyeballs and for our souls. One way he speaks to me is to allow a theme to kind of emerge from the people and the circumstances around me. That's just how I've come to understand how God talks to this soul. And, and um, maybe different for you, maybe, you know, we're all unique. He's going to speak to us the way we need to hear. And I know that sometimes I just need something blatant to catch my attention. And when you hear the same thing repeatedly, I'm taking it to be a hint, you know? And so it's like he's saying, he's like he's saying to me, hey, Mike, check this out. Let's look at this together. That reminds me of a verse in Isaiah 1 in which the Lord says to Isaiah, come now and let us reason together says the Lord, Isaiah 118, the first half of the verse. When he does this, our all-knowing God is not hoping we will help him figure something out. If God says, come, let us reason it together, I don't think God's going, boy, I hope Mike can help me get through this because I really don't know what to do here. I don't think the Lord is that way. And I also want to say that if something comes up and it catches us off guard, like, I don't know, a worldwide pandemic, God didn't slap himself in the forehead and say, I didn't see that coming. He knows everything that has ever been, is happening right now, and ever will be happening as a simultaneous event. We approach him as if he's one of us. And no, he is way beyond this. But he's trying to bring us closer to how he is so that we will see things and sense things and reason through things the way he does. So come let us reason together. It's not God hoping we can give him some information to help him put the puzzle together. 
He does this because he is the ultimate good father and he's guiding us so as to teach us something. Everything God does for us is for our benefit because God needs nothing. Recently, most of the world was shut down during the first round of COVID. No one but God knew any of this or how any of this was really going to work out. We're relaxing some as we learn real information about how it's transmitted, how to treat people who have it, how to be reasonably safe uh, by practicing good hygiene and, you know, restraining from coughing on one another and things like that. And also, I'm, I'm hearing that if you stand on the X in the store, it's like base. You're safe. You can't get out because I'm on the X. And then I can move from that X, and then I'm not safe. And then I go to this X, and I'm safe again. You know, and so I'm learning all about this, you know, because it's so important that we know. But really, we don't really know how this is going to work out. God knows. In the meantime, life is still happening. People are still getting cancer. People are still recovering from cancer. People are getting in wrecks. People are losing their jobs. People are getting new jobs. People are having babies. People are being born. People are passing away. That They were scheduled. God says that he knows our days. He knows the instant I'm going to die. And I'm not going to die a second before that. Things are still happening. COVID is not our world. It's just something that's happening. And I know if I lose a friend or a relative to it, their loss is going to be big to me. But it's not the world. They were going to pass away anyway. That's the way it works. A disease God always and forever knew would come to us will not stop him from establishing his kingdom in the hearts of people, in the hearts of us, and through us, out into the world, and that's wherever we are. In a very familiar verse, God tells us, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not calamity, to give you a future and a hope, Jeremiah 29, 11. And it's in the New King James, but I just read out of the New American Standard. And in, in the King James, in the New King James, word, the word plans is translated as thoughts. The Amplified Bible translates the Hebrew word, and I'm going to try to pronounce this, but I'm just tell you, I am from New Orleans, Louisiana. It's a miracle I speak English. So, so please don't hold me, my feet to the fire on the pronunciation of a Hebrew word. But I do have it phonetically, so that'll help. Um, I'll probably mess it up anyway. Mak ash aba. How would you like me to wake up and say that to you? Yeah. Um, the word thoughts. The word means a purpose, a device, an intention. That's a little bit more than somebody thinking about you, isn't it? It's, I, I have, he has an intention for us. I think about God's intention all the time for me and for the people that receive me. He says that these things are for our welfare, but the word means more than that. It means more than that, we will just fare well, which is what we hear when we, when we see that word. We tend to hear that word, and we think it just means things are going to go okay. But it really means peace or tranquility. Think about that. God wants us to have tranquil lives. Are you seeing a whole bunch of that around us right now? I mean, out there and sometimes among us. Um, we're not seeing a lot of tranquility. Some people are freaking out, you know, pretty bad. God wants us to be able to have tranquil lives, even when a disease is killing people and moving all our social landmarks around. You know what I mean by that? It's the stuff that we don't even know that our soul is used to seeing, that we use like landmarks, like that tree that always was there, and now it's gone, or that house that used to be on this corner. Now, I was a hospice chaplain for a while, and they would give me directions out into the countryside. You know, there's a lot of Texas, you know? And, and they would say, go down this road and turn where the house used to be. 
I need, I need a better hint than that. You know, give me some mileage or something. But the reality is, is those people were used to seeing that house. And where it used to be is a landmark. Well, well, the stuff that we're used to seeing, that's a social landmark. That's something that goes on inside of us. I went into, you know, I went into a place not too long ago when the, when the lockdown was happening, and we were all wearing our masks and stuff. And, and, but the cafeteria in the place, uh, we bought our food, had a mask, and the people eating had their masks off. And as I was walking in, I, you know, I've been, you know, house arrest for welfare and not calamity to give you a future and a hope. Tranquility isn't all he wants for us. He wants to give you the gift of hope in your final outcome. That's what the amplified version of, of um, a future and a hope, how it translates. Hope in your final outcome. Now remember, he sees the final outcome. It's now for him. So he wants us to have hope when it's all said and done. In this one verse that's so familiar to us that we seem to gloss over it, God is telling us that he's well aware of the intentional mechanisms that he has always had in place for each one of us so that we will live in peace and tranquility, knowing that we can look forward to anticipating a good life. And that doesn't seem to be happening much in the lives around us. So God, who often speaks to me in themes, I perceive all around me recently had four or five or six people all make the same declaration to me. And it was either the people around me or the mob, that is Facebook. Um, they all made the same declaration. I am stuck. Have you heard anybody say that? I am stuck. Now, I wish I could say that I don't know that feeling personally, but I do. I know it emotionally, but I also know it physically. So I want to tell you a story about that. And hardly anybody knows the story. I don't even know if our kids know the story. Maybe when they watch this. <laughs> um, I grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana. You can drive 20 minutes and be in fresh water to fish in or salt water to fish in or brackish water to fish in. It was... It's called the, fish, the sportsman's paradise, or it was on license plates when I was young. And, and um, I, was, I was fishing or crabbing or shrimping all the time. I mean, I just love, I love that. I love to do that stuff. I got to do some of it last week in St. Louis. It was huge to do this. Well, one day, my dad, who was a New Orleans fighter, fi firefighter, and all my uncles, I don't have any uncles, uh, we're all firemen, you know, and, and, and he learned that a bayou was being dredged and where they put some barge out there in a pump and a big pipe and they sucked water up and sand up to fill in a lagoon on the other side so that that's basically how land is created in, in the marshes of Louisiana. And so they were going to fill us in. Well, the cool thing about it was that it was... Uh, sucking up crabs, the, the kind you eat, you know, blue, blue claw, claw crabs. And, and um, they're delicious. And anyway, all you had to do is stand there with the scoop net and catch them. It was awesome. Didn't even have to use bait. So, so my dad took me and Uncle John, Mr. John, uh, who was the guy that drove the back of a hook and ladder. You know, there's a steering wheel up there. That's what he did. And, um, and his nephew, Joey. So there we were. And so we were going to do that. And I'm thinking, we're all thinking, free seafood, you know? And uh, who doesn't like that? And so we went. Now, John took his 23-year-old nephew, Joey, and Joey was intellectually disabled. He operated about the mental level of a five-year-old. But, you know, he, he looked like a 23-year-old guy. He had facial hair. He had, I remember, because I looked at his hands a lot, and you'll see why in the story. He had hair on his 
arms like I was 14, you know. And, and so he looked like just a younger version of my dad and John, you know. Um, so he physically looked like a regular young man, and he was quiet, so I never really noticed much about him. I'd never been around an intellectually disabled person before, and so I, I had no idea that, about how different he could be. But in a little while, I did. So my dad and Mr. John went off to get something to drink. And it was a little place down the street. It had a lovely name. It was called the Rat's Nest. So we can imagine what they were going to get to drink. And, um, and left me and Joey there. And he told us, <laughs> he told us not to do anything stupid. Now, all of us have either been a young male or been around young males. That's like an invitation, right, to do stupid stuff. So he told us, don't do anything stupid. He knew me. So, so, um, so I did. So what happened was, <laughs> I can explain why it was really a good thing, but it wasn't. Um, one of the crabs was scuttling away. It, it's, if you can imagine this, this loose, wet sand. So it could run across, and I went to go for it. I went, that one crab wasn't going to get away from me, right? So, well, when I did, I went off balance, and I went, I won't, but I went right off the bank. It was a built-up in Louisiana, and mud. However, the dredging basically caused the entire area to be just this big area of quicksand, and I found myself waste deep in quicksand. So I'm wearing blue jeans, which is what we used to call jeans, and a white t-shirt and some BF Kid sneakers, because that was cool. And um, I guess it's been cool again twice since then. Um, so I'm waist deep in this quicksand. I was, you know it, I was stuck. I could feel it gripping me. It's, it's it's a really a creepy feeling. I remember it whenever I think about it. I, I remember it. I could feel it gripping me. And as I struggled, you know, originally I was probably up to about my thighs. As I struggled to get myself out, to get myself out, I sank more. It was terrifying. I grew up on the Mississippi River, like at the end of my block, and everybody we knew knew someone who drowned in that river. You know, because they said, don't swim in the river. I personally fell in twice. You know, and so, and so we knew, and we knew people that almost drowned, and, and that, that freaked me out. And here I was thinking, I'm going to drown in quicksand. So I cried out. I was terrified. So I cried out to Jesus a lot, but at 14... It was a really bad time to be in New Orleans because there was a lot of racial unrest and, um, and God did this, made me this color and made some other people other colors. And um, so we didn't go anywhere alone after the first time I was jumped and beaten with sticks. So, so I, by 14, I could handle myself pretty well I, um, enough stuff had happened. I wasn't a Christian, so I hadn't forgiven anybody, so I was ticked off all the time. And, and, and you can imagine my attitude towards a 23-year-old man who's laughing and pointing at me while I'm sinking in quicksand. It was not lovely. And I was screaming threats at him, what I'm going to do to you when I get out of here, and all that kind of stuff, which you know, made him laugh a lot more, you know, I mean, he thought this was really, really funny, you know, it's the best show he's ever seen. By the time my dad and Mr. John got back to me, I was hopping mad, but you really can't hop much in quicksand, it just makes it worse, you know, and, and uh, so I was hopping mad, I yelled at my dad for help, and he came and he, he grabbed that thing and pulled me right out. The problem with calling on Joey was that he wasn't capable of helping me. Physically, he could, because he had the body of a grown man, but intellectually, he couldn't comprehend that I just might die. 
So he couldn't help. He couldn't, he wouldn't apply his adult male body to that test. What was my first mistake in this story? My first mistake is I tried to save myself. My first person I called on was me. Someone who was not capable of saving me because me was stuck in quicksand. You know, it wasn't good. Trusting ourselves is called flesh in the Bible. And Romans chapter 8 says it brings death to our souls. Sometimes if you're stuck in quicksand, for instance, it can bring physical death too. I was stuck. And when we're stuck, we must call out to someone who is capable of helping us. Someone stronger than we are. And someone who is not limited by whatever it is that's holding on to us. As several people all at once mentioned they were all stuck, I think that's way more than a coincidence. I sat there pondering what it meant. You know, this is kind of how it works. If God says something to you and it's like, where'd that come from? It's a really good time to say, Lord, what's up with this? And that's probably how deep it was for me. I prayed to the Lord. I asked him, what do you think about this? What, what do you think about all these people all at once mentioning that they're stuck? And what came to me was a verse from Psalm 20 in verse 2. So I went to my Bible and I read the chapter. And if you want to turn to Psalm 40, I'm going to be going through that, the first few verses. There's no indication in that story of, at all of what trial provoked that poem from David. For sure, he had a whole bunch of trials, so it could have been any of a number of them. We just know that he was stuck. And what do stuck people need? Well, they need to get unstuck. That was my thought. <laughs> when I was in quicksand. I need to get out of here. Um, we also know that he knew better than to try to save himself, that he would need God to do that for him. Psalm 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. The words I waited patiently for, they don't mean to spend time waiting as we think about it. That would imply time spent in anticipation of something happening. This term means something completely different. It means I bound myself to the Lord. The root meaning of the term is that of twisting or winding a strand of cord or rope. The word is used to signify depending on and ordering activities around a certain event, a future event. David had bound himself to the Lord God concerning whatever God would eventually do. He bound himself to the Lord. We can live that way if we want. Actually, it's a good thing to do. It, it's, but we can't do it if we don't do it intentionally. That's the thing about trusting God. We m also must learn to trust his timing. I mean, when do people want what they want? I'm a people. When do I want what I want? I want it now, right? Um, Oswald Chambers says that that is the definition of the word lust. Got to have it now. As we read through the first three verses of Psalm 40, let's notice something. David is going to, in those three verses, do two things. That's all he's going to do is two things. Both of which are acts of worship and both of which are acknowledgement of God's power. There's an implied cry for help, and he binds himself to the Lord. Meanwhile, as we go through these three, three verses, we're going to see that God will do six things, all of which benefit David, none of which benefit God. This is our God. This is how our God operates. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. The first thing, God inclines towards us. The first of the six things God does when we bind ourselves to him and cry out to him is that he inclines toward us, which means he stretches out toward us and he pays attention to us.
It's just like when you're sitting in a chair and you begin to speak and, and, and then you're listening to someone and they start saying something that you, you know is God or you know is significant and you don't even realize you're doing it, but you lean in. It's like that extra four inches is going to help you get it better. It, it does a lot. It, I think that it's an it's a attitude of submission. It's an attitude of humility. I think it kind of tills the soil in our soul so that we can absorb it, receive it. But um, this is what God does. That's what that word is about. He, he leans forward. So listen, it's especially important to remember in those times when, it's just, when it seems as if God isn't paying any attention at all. When we cry out to him, he inclines to us. He hears our cry. I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and he heard my cry. He hears our cry. The second thing that God does when we're bound to him and cry out to him is that he hears our cry, a term that means that he actively listens to us. The word cry is most often used to refer to people crying in the Bible, crying out to God for help. That's what that word in the Hebrew is, is used most for. Our God is a father who is ever ready to come to our rescue. He never neglects his children. Now, my earthly father and I, we had some problems, you know. Uh, can you imagine uh, having problems with an earthly father, you know? Uh, I did. Mine have with me. It's because we're all human and fallible. We had our troubles. But when I cried out to him that day, he heard me, and he came to my rescue. He was like God in that way that day. David continues, Psalm 40, verse 2. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. That's why I like that third song, that verse. I just, Jonathan and I looked at each other, and, and Liz and I looked at each other and said, you know, I think they, you know, maybe they stole my notes, you know, probably not. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. God brings us out of pits and out of what causes us to be stuck. I just want to pause just for a second. Maybe you have never been stuck. Most likely you'll find yourself in a place where you're just broadsided by something. You don't know what to do about it. So file it away, and please think, oh, well, I've never been stuck. We're still breathing. Something might happen, you know? So um, he brings us out of pits and out of what causes us to be stuck. The third thing God does when we cry out to him as those totally committed to him, which is what bound to means, is to lift us up, to take us away from what causes us to be stuck. The word brings is a verb, meaning to go up, to ascend, to take away, to lift. It carries with it the connotation of an upward motion. If you've ever been stuck, it feels like you're in, like down in something, like quicksand. I like the idea of God causing me to ascend. You know? He lifts us up out of the horrible pit, paved the roads here with gravel from Bridgeport, oyster shells, and clam shells. So that was a fun walk back to the car. Quicksand, I was in my horrible pit. That was my horrible pit in miry clay. Physically, as hard as I struggled, it would not let go. It kept pulling me down, and it stole my sneakers. You know, it took my shoes. Are you stuck? What is your miry clay? God is powerful. Whatever you're stuck in, there is no match for his power. You know, when my dad pulled me out of that quicksand, it wouldn't have helped me any if he set me right back down on it or right on the edge you know, of that road where the quicksand was. It wouldn't help me at all if he had set me there where I could slip right back down into it and be in the quicksand again. He says, he set my feet upon a rock and he established my steps. When he rescues us, God sets us on a firm foundation. 
The fourth thing God does for us when we cry out to him is that he causes us to stand on a solid place, a secure place. The Hebrew word for rock is selah, which is at the end of a whole lot of psalms. It means, it's S-E-L-A-H. I actually know how to pronounce that one. Um, it can mean a lofty place, but it figuratively refers to a fortress. In Psalm 18, God gives us this beautiful image of our God because I wasn't paying attention to where I put my feet. You know, I was paying attention to something I could get. That's really what I was doing. You know, I could have just as easily gone on the other side of that pipe and snagged that sucker. But I thought that I could do it. I put myself at risk. He also established my steps, David said. God establishes our steps. The fifth thing God does for those who bind themselves to him and call out to him when desperate is that he prepares our path to be firm and certain. This speaks of us walking intentionally with him. The Apostle Paul advised us to live intentionally with God. In Ephesians 5, uh, 15 to 16, the New American Standard will be up here, but I'm going to read out of the, I mean, well, the NI, New King James is there, but I'm going to read out of the NIV, the New American Standard, the NASB. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most time, most of your time, because the days are evil. I had a guy I pastored for a while, and this dude must have broke his feet or his ankles 15 times in the years that I knew him. And the reason was he didn't pay attention to where he went. And one day we prayed, and this verse came to my mind. And I, and I, put, it, I put it before him, and I said, what? God is telling you to walk. God actually enables us to respond to his love and goodness and his rescue in Psalm 40, verse 3, he says this, He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. God puts praises in our mouths. I pastor a woman named Leslie. Uh, she lives in um, the paradise that we know as New York City. And she, um, for a long time, we do, we do house church, and for a long time, she would play guitar and, and sing songs that everybody knew. And then the Lord began to give her songs. He put praises in her mouth and in her heart, and she began to write those. And then she went to live in, what was that, Paris, Texas, or Venus? She went to Venus, Texas, a different kind of paradise on earth. And, and she went there, but she went to work in a school there, but she didn't know anybody. And we were talking, and she was saying she's going to live in a little travel trailer she bought for it. It was like, God said, go to Venus. So she went to Venus, and that's why she's in New York City. Um, but she said, I think I'm going to be pretty lonely. And the Lord gave a prophetic word, and I said, the Lord says that you're going to write a plethora of songs. She was not going to have a whole lot of distractions, and as people here, they hung out with her all the time, and distracted her sometimes, but it was great because it's relationship. But um, she came back with like 15 songs. God put songs in her mouth. She's still doing it. She texted us a song yesterday. And I was like, I'm really happy to hear your voice. You're not here for a reunion, are you? Because they ain't having it this year. You know? <laughs> but, but I was hoping. You know, He puts praises in our mouths. He gives us new songs. The word new means a fresh new thing. And why is that important? It's because every single time God does anything for one of us, it is a one-of-a-kind, never-been-done-before thing. Even if we hear stories of God, you know, sending someone to help us with our car that's broke down, it's, it's a unique thing. Nothing is exactly the same. For instance, this time it's me and not somebody else. Or it's going to be someone different or the circumstance can be different. Something is new about it and we can sing about it. Lamentations 322 in the ESV version, which I think is English standard. The st and I, I chose that because the song I learned, I learned with these words exactly. So I went looking for the lyrics. It says, 
the steadfast love of the Lord never changes. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Every day, every mercy is new every morning. God puts a new song in our mouths. I see this as us speaking or even singing a testimony about what God did for us. In fact, that's what David calls it. He has put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God, praise to our God, praise to our God. Doesn't that sound phrase good? Doesn't that phrase sound good? My wife's a speech therapist. When I do stuff like this, I look at her like, what just happened in my brain, you know? Um, many years have happened in my brain. Um, the thing about praising God for what he has done for us is that it's not intended to be used to market ourselves as being special or super Christian or super duper uh, spiritual or even God's favorite, as some in the body of Christ are fond of saying about themselves. He has put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Praising God or test, testifying about what he's done. Hey, what'd you do this weekend? Let me tell you about something that happened to me. It's not bragging. It's meant to highlight God and only God. The result is that many will see what God has done for us and will know that he really is a loving and vigilant and responsive father. They will see that in fear, which means to be in awe of him. Then our initial trust in him that caused us to bind ourselves to him and cry out to him will result in them trusting him as well. I don't know, we're going to have a song at the end of what I do. We're getting pretty close if y'all are going to do that. They will see that fear and they'll be in awe, in awe of him. This is one of the most effective forms of evangelism there is. And it all starts with the humility of admitting to ourselves that we aren't strong enough to save ourselves. This is a good kind of weakness. Yeah, it's good because we got it. I mean, there's nothing we can do about that. But it's a good thing to acknowledge. When people go into 12-step programs to be free of alcohol or drugs, the very first part is to say, I realized that I couldn't do this, but someone greater than myself could. So that's awesome. Are you stuck in anything? There are many different kinds of quicksand, and Satan loves hurting people. It could be sadness. It could be depression. It could be pride. Fear is on the prowl in our world right now. It always is, but it's like, man, it's like a drink, an energy drink, you know? Fear is, is working. It ensnares people, and it enjoys snaring people. It's a spirit. Scripture actually talks about it as a demon. It's a spirit of fear. And so there's this demon running around having a great time uh, controlling people. Is it some diagnosis that consists of lots of initials? Are you stuck? There is a way out of the horrible pit, the miry clay, and the way's name is God. Are you bound to him? Are you totally committed to him? We don't get x-rays where we can x-ray extra, other people's souls and know if they're committed to God. That's me and him, you and him. That's how it works. I don't know if anybody's committed to him. I can see stuff people do, but I don't know how they really are. God can, and you know. Do you still intend to trust yourself or stuff or substances or other people or really anything of this earth to save you? If so, maybe it's time to admit that nothing of the earth can save you. Only God can do that. Maybe it's time to bind yourself to him. Maybe it's time to bind yourself to him for that. Will you cry out to him? Will you stop struggling and pridefully fighting him? Now, why did I say it like that, pridefully fighting him? Because when I presume to do something for myself that only God can do, even in the name of strength or faith, 
I really am being prideful because I think that I could be a God replacement. What's a God replacement called in the Bible? An idol. It's kind of prideful for me to bump God off the throne for that issue, right? First Peter 5, 5b through 7 says this, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. It's such a beautiful verse. It's one of my favorite ones. I hope we'll all stop resisting him. Allow him, let's allow him to be God in our lives. It'll feel good for us to have our feet set on a rock again and our steps established. So I want to thank Pastor Jonathan and Holly for inviting me to speak here today. I want to thank you all for staying away, for doing an awesome impression of that. Um, and for the response, it really, it really helps. We're going to have a song. If you need prayer for the things we heard today, but if you need prayer,